one of the uh, the hallmarks of a of a aspiring bluegrass player is the ability to play fiddle tunes. I mean, that seems to be the 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 golden grail of uh, of players these days. And of course, nobody uh, plays fiddle tunes the way you do. And um, <clears throat> I wonder if we could we could try a couple of fiddle tunes. One that comes to mind is a is a, Mon a Bill Monroe instrumental called Stony Lonesome, which is. Uh, I consider a tune that's unique, uh, being adapted to the acoustic guitar from the fiddle. And uh, the uh, the Bluegrass Album Band recorded this on an instrumental album uh, with uh, J.D. Crow and myself and Doyle Lawson and uh, Bobby Hicks and Vassar Clements and uh, Jerry Douglas and Todd Phillips. We had, uh -huh. we had done a, numerous volumes of, of uh, a, a bluegrass album series, and the last one we did was an all-instrumental album that had this tune on. Now, let me ask you about the capo because uh, you're putting a capo on here. Um, why are you using the capo for one thing? Well, to play it in A. Uh, most most fiddle tunes are played in the key of A. Right, and, and uh, you play it out of a G position. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, which most uh, guitar play, most bluegrass guitar players do uh, that. Uh, has he slowly evolved? Uh, I'm sure there was earlier guitar players that would play a fiddle tune out of A, and right. I admire the ones that do. Um, Eric Thompson, in particular, I know, I know you know of Eric yeah, sure. and his playing. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Thompson is, is one of those guys gifted that can play almost any fiddle tune that would originally have been played or written in the key of A on a fiddle. Eric can play it in open A on a. Uh -huh. Acoustic guitar, but I, I think most people use uh, use a capo. And I know you favor a certain kind of a capo there. Um, can you talk a little bit about the capo? Yeah, this this one was made uh, custom for me about I think sometime in the late seventies or early eighties. I got it uh, was was uh, made and designed uh, by a guy named Tom McKinney. And these capos can still be had, although they're they're uh, getting increasingly more and more difficult to find, but they uh, they can still be had. Uh, it's a design based on a capo that goes back to around the turn of the century, which was uh, a latching mechanism of sorts that with a thumb screw you could adjust the tension of the capo itself to how tight or how loose it, that, uh, that you'd want to have it. When you put the capo on, is there a particular way that you put it on so that it, um, it's just the way you want it? Well, I try to uh, try to put it as close to the fret as is practical. Um, there's there's a little area right behind the fret where any capo, whether a fixed tension capo or uh, an adjustable tension capo like this one, there's a point where if you put it so far behind the fret, and just just for uh, demonstration purposes. You can see what happened if I would put it there in relationship to the fret. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it was over tightened, you can see what would happen. All these strings would be pulled downward behind that fret. Right. Well, they'd all go sharp. Mm -hmm. And so putting it uh, putting it close to the fret leaves very little leeway for error in terms of that. As, as close to the fret as you, could, you can practically get it. <laughs> So you try you not to over tighten the, it. Near the problem. I mean, you have, whenever you put a capo on any instrument, they're all going to go sharp. It's just the laws of physics dictate that. But uh, to a much lesser degree, if you can, can put it close to the fret and tighten it only as much as it needs to be tightened to, uh, to minimize the amount of rattle that right. you get using a capo.